All right, it's a small group, so I'm going to tailor it kind of to the audience a bit, and it can be a little more conversational if people want to chime in with a question. I'm fine with that. Um, if I'm going to wander, I probably should have the clicker with me. All right, so yeah, the title is Building Your Studio UX Competency and Culture When You Don't Have a UX Department. Um, most of you, or some of you already know me, but I started in, in research way back when. Um, I actually started in grad school. I studied judge and jury decision making in cases of complex scientific evidence and how they evaluated uh, the evidence and made decisions. Um, my first games job was at Microsoft Games User Research Studios. It was kind of at the beginning when they were staffing up and hiring a bunch of play test and user test, uh, usability testing researchers. And I learned a lot during my time there. And then I've spent some time uh, in the late 2000s before 2010, like, it used to be that like only Microsoft really had the usability lab and then other, other big publishers started to uh, build them in because they knew how valuable it was. But there was a sweet time in there where a lot of the big publishers didn't have um, their own user testing services and so I got hired out by a bunch of the big publishers to just go work on some of their titles. Um, and then, so that's kind of one part, the research part. The other part is more of the direction, design, and production part. Uh, as producer at Big Huge Games and shipped a few titles that way. Also kind of their UX person on site. Um, worked at Amazon on social and community features, Zynga, Disney Mobile, and I'm currently doing the, um, the consulting thing again. This time focused not on direction, uh, sorry, not on research, but on direction. Um, so, by the way, I've never built a UX org, right? So I'm talking about building UX competency and culture, but I've never actually built an org. Um, and if folks here who I don't know yet are interested in, in building an org, we've got lots of great resources here. We've got Celia over there who's built at least one org. We've got Mia who's building an org at Rovio. So definitely if you're interested, stick around and try to talk to some of those folks too. Um, I started off uh, not even knowing what UI was, and we'll get to the whole UI UX thing, but uh, I, I, was the, I burned out of graduate school and I uh, went to a company that did data analysis and they had a bunch of fresh out of college graduates working there and they'd only known how to use a mouse uh, a mouse to click around and do things. They never knew how to do like a Unix terminal or anything like that. It was very intimidating to them and what I did was I just, well, okay, I'll just take some Calvin and Hobbes ASCII art and then I'll create a form for them and then they'll be able to submit jobs. So, you know, Calvin will say, what date range do you want and how many, uh, what, what are the providers that you need to search for and stuff like that and then they could do it in a fun kind of way. And that's when I discovered UI existed as a thing. Uh, and then I worked on several games over the years. Um, these are some of the ones that I was more deeply involved with and then I've worked on dozens and dozens more. Um, over the years, most, a lot of them really small, like from one developer ones up to, to, to uh, bigger AAA titles. Um, but the other secret is like most likely none of you are gonna uh, build a UX department either. Um, the, this is like a, an amortiz amortization table here. It's just, if you're a smaller studio and you only have one product, you probably don't have a lot of money to spend on a dedicated UX department. Um, and then a lot of times it's just we never really think we need it until you actually find out that you do. And a majority of like teams that I've engaged with over the years, whether with a publisher or just on my own, uh, usually you come in like pretty late in the process because people aren't just thinking about it. It's changing a little bit. Um, and ideally if you have a publishing deal, you should get your publishers to do a bunch of this stuff for you. Um, so you know, f when you're trying to find the right publishing partner, um, talking to publishers that have UX programs, especially research programs, super valuable. So why am I giving the talk? Um, well, basically, like, I've just worked in UX for a number of years. I've worked on scores of games and different roles. Um, some of them have been flops. Some of them have been very successful. Um, I'm looking at you, Frontierville, for successful, and I'm looking at you, Tony Hawk Ride, for not so successful. Um, I worked with dev studios of one to dev studios of like 75 plus plus people all over the world and obviously publishers too and I've been engaged for like a month or so on a small project to up to three years on other projects. And so my basic point is, is that you don't have to have a UX org, a UX org uh, to have great UX. You can still build great UX without having a dedicated organization. Uh, also, I had no direct reports during any of this time. Well, I did as a publisher, when I was a producer, uh, I had some junior producers with me, but I've never actually like built a department of dedicated UX folks uh, and then had the ability to order them around and to do things. 
Oh, and just leadership without authority is this management without authority is kind of my thing. I like to work with really smart teams, smart people, uh, tell them how bad their game is, and then come up with ways to make, make it better. And it's just kind of what I've been doing over the years, and somehow or other they keep talking to me. Um, so quick takeaways for the talk. Uh, I'm gonna talk about my holistic definition of UX, uh, my approach to building a UX competency and culture, and then I'll sprinkle in some tactical tips here and there. Uh, but first, let's just have a little um, who we are here so I can get a sense. Some of you I know, so I'll, I'll know, but I'll, if I could just get a raise of hands when I ask some of these questions. So how many of you are students? Hands up. Okay, good. Uh, how many of you are a professor? Okay, oh good, some professors here, awesome. Um, how many of you here are, um, how many games, or sorry, how many people are in the games industry? I'm assuming the rest of you, correct? Yeah, okay, awesome. Um, and then for the games industry folks, how many games have you launched so far? Like one, two to five, just hold up your hand until I get to it. Two to five, 10, 20. So a nice mix of people who've launched a few games, launched several games, and have obviously been launching games for a long time. Um, and how many here are the founders or the studio execs where they currently work? Okay, one, two. Reluctant hands going up. It's okay to be an exec, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> um, and then so why are people at this section? Hands up for people who are already doing game UX research as their career progression. Okay, a few of you. How many of you want to become game UXers? Okay, so the rest of you, I'm assuming, are just interested in UX more generally and how do we do it better at our studio. Perfect, so I've got some of that covered here too. Um, just a bit of shameless self-promotion. Uh, tomorrow I have a board gaming workshop that I do. Um, we get to play board games and talk about UX and, and think about uh, in an environment where people don't read, how do we figure out how to play a game? So come to that if you have time and want to. It's, it can be, it's usually pretty fun. Um, okay, so my holistic definition of UX. So what is UX? And this, is, this gets back to the whole, you know, I started out in UI with the Calvin and Hobbes ASCII art. And a lot of people, when they think UX, they think UI. So we're looking at HUD design here, uh, you know, how much money you've accumulated, uh, mini map, things like that. Uh, I'm gonna play a video here, though, because actually it's so much more. I'd like to get the volume just really far down. So here's Crimson Skies, the game that I worked on. And when you think about the user experience, you think, well, one of the complaints we got early on was that the plane never felt fast. And the way that they had to run the physics model, the planes actually couldn't go very fast. So we had to do things like add contrails, uh, change the sound as you sped up to help the users feel like they actually were going faster, even though they weren't actually going faster. Um, here we're navigating around and we're obviously in a combat situation. We've got our sort of red dots on the minimap. So that, explode, that secondary explosion that you had on the plane, notice that there is a health bar up here, but no one's gonna be looking at that health bar during a dog fight, dog fight, right? So we need to let people know when significant changes to their health status comes where they're focused, which is on their plane generally or situationally around their plane. So we added those secondary explosions. You'll also see sometimes that bullets hit it but don't seem to do any damage. We had a big problem with uh, people dying from off-screen enemies and not knowing why they died. And so we have, uh, we have as, had to sit, we put in a system to uh, make it so that the bullets would kind of appear to hit you before they actually did hit you. So you'd get a sense that they were hitting you and then you'd be able to turn away and survive. Cutscene. Nathan, something's rattling under my hood. Maybe I should swing by the repair shop and. Ah! Yeah, better get Memories. that checked out. Good luck I don't know how many times I watched this video. So now, notice the music has changed. And the minimap comes up. Notice now we have blue HUD indicators and um, minimap indicators. You're not in a dogfight anymore, right? You're not under threat. Uh, actually, Max gave an interesting talk earlier on, I can't remember, Max Pears maybe, about just having safe spaces and comfortable spaces. This is an example of a comfortable space. You don't have the angry red dots, quiet music or calming music these blue dots that you can, it's, it's time to explore, right? And now I've decided I have an objective, I look at my health bar, I'm like, yeah, I should probably go over to the wrench and wrench myself up. Okay, so 
that's, when I think about user experience, like I think about a lot of things, and I think you all should too, uh, because we can, it, it, the game depends on much more than just the obvious UI to make it work. And in fact, the less you dependent on UI, the better the game will probably be. Um, so things like um, on the home screen, um, you know, you want to make sure that your core loop is represented. You know, Clash Royale does a, a, a sort of, yeah, Clash Royale does a great job. You know, it's big battle button. That's what they want you to do over and over again. And then, you're, of course, you're collecting things, and then you're investing them into your decks and out editing your decks. And you've got nice little point uh, or progression mechanics and appointment mechanics to make me want to come back later. Um, and then, you know, we already just talked about a little bit on the video, the, the core, uh, the camera controls, the in-game feedback, or HUD elements, you know, where do you position these on-screen affordances. Uh, the first time user experience or onboarding or tutorials, there's a lot of different theories and ways to do these types of things that we can talk about maybe tomorrow at the workshop or some other time. I'm not gonna spend time talking about different ways of doing it, but the idea is, is that that onboarding experience is user experience. And then you've got your social features, so you know, how do I communicate with people in-game? How do I find them and socialize with them and maybe team up with them in a game that requires cooperation? Uh, and then obviously you've got the sharing of the social aspects of the game, so streaming, um, those sorts of things. And obviously a lot of work has been lately on the UX of you know, making our game uh, eSports friendly or, or Twitch friendly. But there's also tech issues. I find that uh, I don't, Sometimes, like some of the developers are like, "Oh, well, we'll just we'll build you some tools so you can do UX, you, you can do the UIs faster and iterate more quickly, or we'll expose the controls of the steering uh, so that you can test a bunch of different steering settings." Uh, but there's a lot more that our programmers can do too, because really, a lot of the th the UX is defined by uh, actual technical performance. So we've obviously got like this sort of stuttery kind of jittery thing going on here. You never want to see long load times. And this is a funnel chart. Someone who worked at Zynga did it on, uh, provided it on his, a game he was working on, just showing how bugs and technical issues uh, caused large drop-offs. Um, and just so, uh, just to back up the fact that, you know, UX is also all these things. Uh, and then for multiplayer, you've obviously got your latency issues. Um, griefing, you know, actually, who do we match together? How do we make sure that, you know, the griefers aren't hanging out with people who will be upset by griefers? Uh, and then all the different matchmaking permutations um, that make for a good match. So really, when I talk about UX, I say UX is everything, and I do kind of mean everything. Uh, but really what it comes down to is kind of answering these four questions, right? Can players figure out how to play the game? Are players bored, for, uh, confused, or frustrated? Are players engaged and interested in continuing? Uh, and is the game fun to play? And I only include a little asterisk there because really you can test for other types of things too. Um, you can validate other emotions like sadness or empathy or fear and other purposes like you know, serious games for learning or having some psychological growth or therapy. Uh, but really what this also translates to is game health more generally. Um, you know, these types of things relate to, you know, how do we increase the uh, first time user experience com completion rate? How do we retain players better? How do we monetize better? Um, app health is so important to the success of a game, right? It's got to sort of exist in a way that people are continuing to play it and stick around. Uh, and the takeaway here is that UX drives all KPI. So UX, at least in my opinion, is pretty essential to the process if you're gonna, if you're gonna have a game that survives. So my approach to uh, building UX competency and culture, um, and I've divided it into a couple of sections. The, the, first I'll talk about some situational constraints, uh, then about from the studio owner level, uh, and then from studio leadership, and then individual contributors. So situational part first. So basically, you know, there's all sorts of circumstances surrounding whatever title that you're working on. You've got dates, you've got budgets, You've got expectations in terms of how you want it to perform. Um, and so uh, how, how that's structured and how much time and money you have left directly affects the process you're able to use. So the ones that we all love are, you know, you're involved early with the project and you can iterate a whole bunch early on. You're far away from any kind of launch considerations. And you've got the one where you're like, yeah, we know UX is important, but it's not been a problem so far because we've just been playing it ourselves. And then, oh, 
oh yeah, we're launching soon and we probably need to fix the UX because no one's gonna be able to figure out how to play. And then you have the project on fire. Uh, they're actually live, you're collecting actual data and you're realizing that you are not hitting your KPI. So I'm gonna talk about each one of those just a little bit separately. So the, here, the, you know, the early embedded, you've got the happy team of scientists, we're all relaxed, we're having fun, we're able to answer some important questions. And there's things that you can do here that you need to think about the value of it because doing it this way is more expensive in some ways, but it's the long-term return on your investment is what you gotta focus on. So you can start hypothesizing about your KPIs of interest for your, your app health and game behaviors you wanna see be, uh, players engage in and game behaviors you don't want to see them behave in. For instance, if you're thinking about negative behaviors uh, in regards to social community and things like that. It allows you uh, much more power to mitigate risks. So if you wanna do something innovative um, or if you realize that a certain thing like um, responsiveness or no lag is critical to the success of your product, you can front load those things in your planning and make sure that you nail them early on uh, that you, instead of saving it for later and then you kind of just have to ship it with, with what you're left with. And you can use a lot of the UX best practices both in terms of your design process um, and also in terms of the research process and do much more user testing, which is a great, uh, a great idea. Um, UX debt is the sort of, you know, amount of UX struggle that is now in the game because we've been just been jamming new features and content in and we just haven't had a chance to clean things up. Um, you can start budgeting for it and especially if you have like a UX strategy that involves testing, you can start to say, well, part of your week up to a UX test has to be tackling some of the UX debt most likely to surface problems um, in a usability study or a playtesting study. Um, sometimes you're not a group of happy scientists. Sometimes you're <laughs> a scientist who is just out on their own in a hostile world uh, and you still have to solve problems. Um, so this is the soft launch case. Um, usually you have a tight deadline that's totally immovable. Um, you still have your hypotheses about like what it's gonna take for this game to be successful, um, but you don't have time to do all the stuff. Uh, you can only do a few things. And usually what I talk to people about is you know, at this stage of the project, there's probably a million things that we could do to try to improve the game. Uh, let's pick five that we believe in and that we actually think that we can influence and will have a good return on investment. This is the time where you just really have to sort of triage and dig down deep. Um, it's still usually, you'll still have time uh, because there's so many user research options available like real time, especially on mobile, you'll still have time to do some quick and dirty user research, uh, which is still essential to do at this type of the process part of the process. Um, and for UX debt, you just have to triage really viciously here because um, you've got to plan for like, well, what absolutely needs to be hit for soft launch? What needs to be hit for before we move from soft launch into maybe a few more ge geographies? What happens, before, what do we, when are we gonna launch with monetization and things like that? And you're gonna have to really carefully slot those into bins. Um, and at this point, you know, it's like, oh, we'll just fix it after launch. That, that means if, if that's gonna be your approach and you're not gonna really assign it to a specific time in the product life cycle, it probably means it's never gonna get fixed. Hear that? I'm sure we've all heard that a number of times. Oh, we'll fix it when it's live, don't worry about it. Uh, this is the section when we're live. So we don't actually have hypotheticals here now, we have our actuals, right? We know our KPI at this point, we're collecting data uh, and we see that they're not doing what we want. The process is very similar to uh, what we do when we're just before soft launch, in other words, you gotta triage really deeply. You've gotta pick on the things that you think we're gonna really move the needle most that you can actually do within budget and scope. Um, and then you validate both with live data. Hopefully you've built yourself a process while you're live where you can update the game reasonably frequently. Um, but also I like to have people do um, some uh, observational user research at the same time. Analytics will tell you what's happening but the why sometimes is harder to deduce, and so having some good observational research to complement that is often really useful. Um, and then UX debt as well, you gotta just, you prioritize it based on what, you know, what's our KPI that's failing right now or failing hardest, and you, know, you, you look at your backlog of UX debt and try to attack that. Um, so at the end of this all, you either resuscitate the, program, the, the, the game and you bring it back to a happy state, uh, or it, it dies. I mean, you just realize that there's no point in throwing more money after it. Um, we should just start on our next game. And to that point, this is the really interesting thing. Like, 
in, our, in this room, probably none of us, but maybe one of us, the next game they ship will be the one they retire on, right? Like most of us are probably gonna have to make several more games before we retire or you know, leave the industry or whatever uh, and never have to work again, right? So what you've gotta remember is the entrepreneurs and studio founders who are making these games, they're really good at getting money to make more games. Like that's one of their skills. And so uh, what you've gotta remember is that, this is that each game is not your last game and that in fact, you know, there will be another game. And ideally, if you've done your job right, they'll realize how valuable the UX stuff is and they'll wanna do it earlier next time and then you'll be able to get that nice, happy group of scientists again. All right, let's talk about studio owners. So really, uh, driving your culture and competency starts at the very, very top. Um, because UX drives the KPI, and it, which is really the health of the studio, sorry, the health of the product, which of course then affects the health of the studio. Um, and UX is not just like hiring another UI designer um, or agreeing to do a couple of tests. You need to support that with actual development production infrastructure. You need to actually set aside time and budget time to do the fixes that are needed uh, and to iterate quickly to try to find solutions. So you need someone who controls the money and the, the creative and business vision uh, to, be a, to be invested. Uh, so this picture here is me and Brian Reynolds here. We were working on, I don't know if it was Catan or Reckoning or, or what, but Brian was the founder and CEO of, uh, and um, chief game designer of Rise of Nations. And he, um, he sat in almost every, every usability study that I was in, he was, he was in. So he, he was with me most of these usability studies. So that's a pretty big dedication of time. The, the team from Big Huge Games visited Microsoft, I think six times for almost a week each time. And we spent five of those days in the usability lab. So they were super, he was super invested right from the top down. More important or equally important is this. This is Brian's wall of pain. Some of you may have heard about it from other talks that, uh, that I've given or other folks who've worked with Brian have given. But the idea is th this is how committed he is to UX. He's like, this is the wall of things that we must do before we can progress any further. I am the only one by I, not me, him. I can try to influence him. I am the one who says these are the priorities, these are the things we need to fix before we can say the game is working as expected and we can move on to the next point. Um, so again, buy-in from, the, from, the, from the, the very top is critical. Um, you also, as, a, as, a, as an owner, you wanna hire and, and train UX leaders. Really, I find the best UX leaders are just the best game developers in general. They're folks who aren't defensive and they're open to learning and improving. Um, and they understand trade-offs, right? They, a lot of times, especially when I was younger in UX, it was just, you know, how can these guys be so dumb? Like, this is obvious, we totally need to fix it and we need to fix it this way and we need to do it now. Well, you need folks who are a little, have a little more perspective and are able to understand the trade-offs between fixing now, fixing later, doing the optimal fix versus doing a fix that's good enough. You need, and, and who can talk to other people, oftentimes the people are very passionate about this stuff and, and resolve it in a way that makes sense. You wanna seek out independent feedback. Um, religious feuds happen all the time. You've got your entire studio is working on a game, half of them want the y-axis inverted by default, half of them don't, or you know, any kind of thing. Um, and you know, how do you resolve these disputes? Because everyone is you know, super passionate and really believes in their case. And sometimes you just have to get independent folks to, to come in, ideally trusted friends, publishers, if you have a good relationship with your publisher, they should be able to provide some of that feedback too, ideally with user testing. Uh, and then you can hire out other folks too. Um, studio leaders. So one thing that I've tried to do at a couple of studios I've worked with is create a, a UX bar raiser council. We had that at, Mike, at, uh, sorry, at Amazon, whereas basically the UX bar raisers were independent of teams. I mean, they all worked on product teams, but they could, they were expected to be having their noses in other projects going on at Amazon. And if they're like, this is not up to the UX standards of, Amazon, I'm gonna, well, they, it wasn't just UX there, but it, was, it probably was a lot of UX, but you know, I'm gonna call it out and they need to respond to me because I'm a UX bar raiser. They can't just ignore my feedback and it's gonna be escalated right to the top. Doing that in, 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 in a studio is a great idea too. 
you need to pick individuals who are interested in UX and having a great UX. They're subject matter experts. You obviously you want them to be your, you know, ideally senior artists or senior developers, senior game designers, and they're trusted to make good decisions um, by the by the people in the company. People trust them, um, and as a group, they should keep each other accountable, right? If I'm the tech director. Um, and I notice that like the control scheme is totally out of whack, I should be able to go over there and say, what is going on with you guys? And similarly, if I'm the artist and it's like, hey, our load times really stink, what's going on? The dev might just say, well, you need to, <laughs> you need to optimize your art process or something like that. But, you, but the, the idea is that they need to be able to hold each other accountable. Um, establishing UX pillars and expectations is really important. This is lifted um, from Om Tandon, who's uh, provided a bunch of really cool articles on UX, game UX over the past couple years. Uh, and he's like, why don't we have a UX design Bible? And this actually makes sense, right? The only way you can really execute on it is to identify what are the things that you really want to uh, succeed at in terms of UX, what are the things that are critical failures that you must avoid, and, and um, outlining them and making sure that you hold, when you do milestone reviews and stuff like that, you, you hold the, uh, the development team accountable to those things. Um, and as well, you want to use your competitor research to set expectations. So you want to make sure that, you know, if you're making a game that's going to be competing with these ones, well, you certainly, if, if these ones here suffer from UX issues, you know, one of your competitive advantages might be to, you know, improve the UX in that area. And you certainly don't want to fall below the bar, right? You don't want to be harder to get into than any of those games because the friction there is going to be almost impossible to overcome. You need to have an escalation process. Um, business vision, creative vision, and execution collide all the time. Uh, we need more monetization features. We need more cool stuff to blow up. Um, and then you have discussions about, you know, let's jam in some more features. Hey, everyone's complaining about like, the fact that our game is broken. You need to have a way to escalate those up to the very top so that the right decisions are made. Because far too often, at least in places that I've worked, it's, you're so focused on the short term and you make the, you make the wrong call because uh, you can't see that the longer term is really where you need to focus your attention. Um, this is a horribly worded title, but it, I call it design by hand waving. Hey, everybody, we're in a design meeting and we're talking about this game. And well, here's the example with Dragon Veil World, a game that I worked on a little bit. Um, well, Heyday is really popular now. So when we harvest um, uh, fruit, we're going to harvest the way Heyday did it, where you push and you drag. And it's actually kind of fun on Heyday. You know, you kind of glide your finger around and all the things go up. Well, as it turns out, like, you know, one of my main concerns was that getting that to look and feel right was going to be a pretty significant risk. Like, it was going to take a lot of iteration and time and effort. Um, and, like, farming is not as important or crucial to Heyday, which is all about farming. Um, so do we want to invest all this time and effort uh, into solving a problem that isn't really there? And so our compromise solution uh, was adding this building here. And so now to make it easier to do the pain of tapping on each one of these and collecting them, you can tap on the building and do a collect all function. Where we did innovate was actually on the planting feature. We had a little like plant shooter that shot all the stuff from the menu into the plot. So it was actually kind of fun to prototype and do. All right, uh, individual contributors. So this guy here, uh, <laughs> he was one of my first bosses at Microsoft. His name's Eric Shu. he's a great guy. Um, and he, he trained me a lot and rescued me from bad situations that I got myself into with teams sometimes. Um, but what I want to, I don't know why I included his image. Oh yeah, probably for the rehabilitation part. But he, his, the key thing that you've got to sort of identify amongst your senior team members are the UX resistors. And oftentimes these folks are resistors for like reasons that like have some validity, right? Like, oh, well, like two years ago we paid a bunch of money for a focus group and they told us to do something and we did it and the game totally sucked. It's like, okay, I see why you're not necessarily interested in user research, like I totally get it. The idea there is that you try to win them over using pilot, small pilot projects and ideally validating it using proper user research techniques in the lab. And I've got an example I'll talk about um, in just a second. Um, there's also, when you work at a lot of companies, there's sort of the person who always has done the UI in the past uh, or always designed the tutorials in the past. 
um, or I've always designed the system control, the controller uh, uh, mappings in the past, and as it turns out, like they're not very good at it. And so that's a hard situation sometimes, especially if the person is defensive about it or not open to, uh, open to change or other influences. Um, if they're good at it already, that's great. Make them UX bar raisers, awesome. That's a strength, you don't have to worry about it. You locked it down. Um, but if it's not so good, it could be a real problem if they're not willing to, um, again, you know, through these small pilot projects, come in, see how some different thinking actually leads to a better result and then be part of the solution. So this is the game Crimson Skies again. Um, so we worked on this game a whole bunch and, and uh, before I took the product over, there was, um, we'd done tons and tons of studies. We were about to give up on it kind of because they weren't, the developers just weren't responsive. We're like, piloting these planes is not fun. Um, and they were all from a more flight sim, combat flight sim background. And so what they love to do to play the game is they love to sit there with the controller, look around the field, uh, plot out what they were gonna do in advance, and then with the analog stick, just like really expertly and interestingly glide their plane around and, and do all these cool things and solve the mission. But we were making this game specifically for action adventure players. Uh, and so we brought in, and to the team's credit, we brought in people who were action adventure, action adventure gamers who weren't big flight sim people. So this game has to appeal to them. And the results were uniformly negative. They, some people became so motion sick that they had to leave usability studies. Uh, when I, we do play tests, the ratings would be like below like any other game possible. But they just couldn't get it. They're just like, well, the, the players just don't get it. They're, you know, they don't play it like we do, and they should, and if they did, they'd have fun. So I brought them into a play test when I, uh, soon after I started on it, and this is more luck than anything. This has nothing to do with me, right? So you notice in the play test labs, uh, everyone's wearing headphones. So actually when you walk into a play test lab, it's very quiet. Um, what my, one of our hypotheses were that we were trying to show the, the dev team was that like, if you're an action adventure player and something, you're about to hit something or you see something exciting, you're gonna slam the stick. You're not gonna do these little fine hitched movements. Um, and so we walk in there and what's the first thing we hear, right? We hear sticks clacking, you know, as people peg the sticks left and right and we hear, oh crap, shit, ah, oh, darn. And then they all sort of looked at each other and looked at me and are like, okay, we finally believe you, like we need to adjust our steering because the gamers that we want to attract are just not gonna have fun with the kind of steering that we've been invested in so far. Um, and the, on a really cool note, they actually, that, that sort of started a really cool collaboration between myself and them. They actually, you know, they're like, oh, we, we gotta do this right. And, well, let's expose the settings in a way that we can alter them uh, in real time, like between usability sessions or whatever. And we can find good default settings for uh, controls uh, sensitivity. And then we can use the best one that we find as the default because also I think as uh, Celia said during our talk or during her talk, it's like when, if you, you never expect people to go back into options and sort of play with their controls. It was, you know, it, whatever the default is, is usually the experience of the person. For junior team members, um, excuse me, uh, so you've got your dedicated UX UI folks. Really, oftentimes it's like dedicated UI folks. They're either 2D artists um, or other artists that are brought in to do the UI part. As it turns out, some of them come from like graphic design backgrounds or maybe a web or less interactive background, and they don't play games, which means that they don't understand interaction design and they don't understand how important feedback is and they don't understand um, how to evaluate an interface on things other than like does it look symmetrical and balanced and are the colors all perfect. Um, and so they really do need to, this is something that I've had to do with most of the places that I've worked is make sure that their, their implementers have started playing more games, especially competitors, relevant competitors. Um, they need to be diligent, but you also need to teach them when to push back and when, it, oftentimes again in these smaller studios, the UI per people are often more junior folks and so they're just trying to please the boss. They're like, hey, we need a screen that has these five options and these six call to actions and everything needs to be available at once with one click away. And they don't yet have the sense of like, actually that's never gonna work. Like that's a really bad idea. We need to just think about it conceptually and how do we actually design this screen to support uh, what we need it to support. Um, and so 
you know, mentoring those folks along that, those lines is really important. I talked about no greeking here. I'm going to show an example in, on the next slide. But the idea is that oftentimes when you're laying things out, greeking is the lorem ipsum, you know, the, the fake taught type that appears in a lot of placeholder types of things. You also do, uh, oftentimes you'll do, um, you do like edge case testing, you'll make sure like what's the longest possible text board we might have here, or what's the most number of digits that our high score will go up to. Uh, and I'll talk about that and I'll show the example in just a second. And for all your junior folks, so not just the UI folks, make sure they're being mentored by, their, by the UX bar raisers you have. Um, and eventually as they get better at it, they're gonna have to just sort of become better at influencing their, their peers and others without authority because sometimes, Sometimes it's a little more subjective whether something should be done or not. And I realize that when you're all working together, expensive project, you can't just get everyone's little pet things in. But sometimes it's, it's more uh, knocking off a few minor things makes a major improvement to the game. And so having them confident to, to dig in and, and argue for those is important. So the greeting versus user stories. So the greeting model is, you know, oftentimes we'll get a, a design like this where the, and, and it's a really useful design, right? But it's designed for the edge cases. So, you know, what's the longest sentence we could possibly have? What's the most ingredients that we could possibly show on a page? What's the most digits we can have here? And that's, that's, that's kind of fine for sort of defining an edge, you know, what, what's the, the, the worst possible case. But we don't really think about how like a first time player versus a mid game player might, or an elder player might want to interact with the screen. They probably have different goals, right? The new player is probably just trying to figure it out and do a few things. The mid game to elder player are probably much more invested in the game and they probably have some efficient, you know, it needs to be efficient for them to go find the one that they need and, and execute on that. Um, so just as a quick tidy up, right? So if, imagine if in, in addition to that edge case design, you also did a first time player design um, you take the same thing, you clean it up a bit as a first time player would say, you know, we're gonna gate content here, we're gonna make it so that you only have one little option, we're gonna make the numbers smaller so they're not big and intimidating, uh, we're gonna make the text here smaller and we're gonna say it's perfect for the beginner. Um, so these are the kinds of things that it's really nice to be able to um, include when you're doing your UI designs for evaluation because it can help you think about how do we solve these things for, uh, for newer players. Uh, and then the, you know, the icing on the cake to just teach like some aspirations and stuff. You could just, you know, hey, you know, why isn't there more stuff? Well, you need to get to level three and then you'll get more stuff. Um, there's resources for all team members here. Um, the deck I think is gonna be publicized uh, and certainly the, the video will so that you don't have to jot these down or you can ask afterwards. But there's a couple of, there's a Discord, a Slack chat, D GDC vault, just search for UX term. Um, there's the, uh, the, obviously the Games User Research Summit, or the GER SIG, and then the uh, UX Summit at GDC, and then there's a Game UX Summit that happens every year. All great things to do and participate in. Um, so I've sprinkled some tactical tips in here or there. Let me just check, on, do I have 10 minutes till the end of the session or 10 minutes to talk before questions? Uh, 10 minutes to talk. 10 minutes to talk, okay. Um, that's perfect. So uh, a couple more tactical tips that I'll just sort of throw in at the end here because I know some of you were just here to, you weren't necessarily thinking about how do I build our culture but maybe how do I do UX or think about UX better. Um, one thing is to always remind yourself that content drives UX. And so when you think about this game, this is Animation Throwdown, came out a couple years ago. And when it launched, uh, it was pretty, I, I got pretty addicted to it I must admit. You're representing the core loop here uh, in your main space, you're, and these are all calls to action, you're basically battling, uh, you're taking your rewards and buying new cards, you're researching and upgrading them, you're changing your deck, and then you're going back and battling again. So this is, a good, this is a, an idea that like, it's really easy to see the core loop, it's easy for me to pick the things that I need to do, um, and if I'm still not sure, I can go to the what do I do next thing up here, which is always why we implemented Quest. It's like, people get to a stage, they're like, what should I do now? Oh, I'll just go look at my quests. Uh, of course, it's a live game, and so you want to keep your elder players engaged and paying. So they added features as they went. You know. So now imagine from a new user's perspective what this would feel like if you entered the game. Where's my core loop? Which one of these things do I tap on? There's too many choices. I'm not sure what I have to do. Um, and so curating that first time user experience is something that's super important to do. We learned that lesson on Frontierville actually, um, a few months after we launched the game, 
we noticed that our first time user experience metrics had like plummeted. And so all the new users were just doing terribly. They weren't making it through the tutorial even. Uh, and what we did was we went back and we analyzed what was going on. Well, we added on so many features at the top of the funnel that there were a bunch of extra click-throughs that you had to do. And then we added so much content to the store that any quest related to the store meant that you couldn't find the items anymore because there are now 20 pages of items. Of course, the premium ones are on the first page. Um, and so you had to page through and find these things that you needed to build, and people were just giving up. So the idea of you know, making sure that the content fits um, the user expectation is, is a real big help. This is just, actually, I'm going to, oh, I can talk about this. So this is just like a little consult um, I did for one of my clients. And the left side is sort of their original pitch. And on the right side is just me kind of touching it up a little bit. I just want to talk about a couple of the things that we did. This is more in terms of our information architecture. Um, one of the really important things that was hard to notice was like the actual age is important. This is a game that takes place over years, and you didn't know how many years. Uh, there's a lot of text here, which is dense, and people are probably really wanting to just go, go, go. Um, so I tried to call out a little more clearly the age information, because the age information will be presented in-game and is actually in important to the uh, knowing when the game ends. Um, and then you know we had just sort of one here, but there was always three stars available, but we never sort of set any kind of aspirational goals of like coming back and really mastering it. And so you know just putting this here is great, breaking these th ups into separate widgets. And then also you can add a little educational component. You know, I'm playing the game a whole bunch. I'm tapping, I'm tapping, I'm probably not reading. At some point I'm like, those green tiles are si kind of interesting. I don't really know what happens when I use them, but oh, I can just tap on it and learn about it. Okay, that's great. And I can do that if I want to, but I'm not interrupted or uh, my gameplay isn't blocked by it. The, one of my all-time favorite games, um, Ratchet and Clank, the original, it came out actually when I was working on Rise of Nations, and it was just the quintessential feel, for me at least, that the designer was sitting behind me thinking, yeah, now he's getting just a little bit bored of what he's been doing. Let's just tease him with something that's kind of new and shiny over here. And then I go and pick that up and be like, oh my goodness, this is awesome, and this totally helps me solve situations that I couldn't have otherwise solved before. Um, and they did a really nice job of it, so it's why I used the example. Um, and the game's basically, you know, you're a ratchet, you got a wrench, you break things, you get bolts, you invest your bolts into buying cooler new stuff and weapons that you then fight the huge, big, scary monsters. Um, so uh, the problem is, is that like, People need to learn how to use all these new things because all the, the weapons behave very differently. And so you can use sort of like, well, you know, as you get a new ability, we'll just, you know, fill in the little icon here. Um, so the next ability I get would go here, and this is how I would access it. You can provide little, you know, options showing some, some controller key mappings, but these aren't really effective ways to get people to adopt a feature or play with it. Um, what you really, what, what's really here is, the, is uh, the idea of player progression and, and the natural pushes that Celia alluded to those in her talk this morning, but getting people to, um, through practice, pushing themselves into new areas where they're ready to explore. So you get something new, you got your wrench, I start to collect some bolts because that's kind of fun, then I discover, hey, there's this robot buddy of mine, and I interact with him a little bit, and he's kind of fun to have, and he climbs onto my back, and he hangs out with me, and he tells me things. And then I find that I've got a bunch of bolts saved up, and there's a little store there, and I can upgrade him to have the little helicopter thing so I can glide further. And then you give me an environment where it's safe for me to glide, and I can experiment with gliding, right? So this is the kind of thing where, when you're thinking about layering on new features, don't just think about, like, okay, well, how do we map them to a controller? Think about how do we use content and progression to, to onboard people to the features. Um, this one... <sighs> So I'm very biased in sort of my training and the way I've built games over the years. I find that the best way to evaluate UX is on an actual build that is reasonably representative. And so for me, the quicker that a developer can get there and be able to iterate on it, the better, because we're going to make decisions with more confidence and we're going to have time to iterate and improve things. And so what I was going for here is just, if you look at on the left-hand side, um, your certainty, and then look at just the certainty column. So if you solve, like if you, if you do mocks and docs and just you know, either like functional specs or uh, you know, some static mockups and stuff, and you evaluate them, you, you, you might be able to make some improvements, but your confidence that in, when it's actually ships, if you just shipped it as it was, is probably pretty low because a lot of things can go wrong. 
Uh, and your confidence kind of increases a bit if you get to the wires and flows sh stage and have some click-throughs and things like that. Uh, when you're doing some internal play testing, and by that I mean with the team only, not a, like having a research psychologist run the studies, but you know internal team play testing to figure out what's the, what's fun and what people are liking and what people are hating. Again, you can you know you can be a little bit more certain. Um, but what's happening on the left hand side here is that your cost of making changes is going up each each step, and so you kind of have this fundamental tension. It's like you know when when a lot of people they're like, well, why don't we just do the mocks and docs really well, and then we'll save a whole bunch of money. The problem is is that this is a, an interactive experience that depends on the content and context of the game, and until you can test it that way, you can't be confident. Um, so this is kind of one of those just sort of. Uh, meant to be uh, used if you have someone, I've worked on some projects unfortunately like this, where they're just like, well, we'll just do it all on mocks or we'll do some click-throughs and then we'll just send it over to the developer to implement it and we'll be fine. Yeah, not so much. Uh, that's it. I uh, only want to just do a little bit of a reminder about my play workshop tomorrow from two to, uh, two to four. If folks are interested, we'll play some board games, we'll talk about UX and, um, uh, and uh, figure out how do we do UX for people who don't read? Um, so basically I'll be giving you board games without any instructions. Uh, questions? Yep, it's question time. Thank you for, for the talk. Uh, if uh, we had uh, pretty much no one in UX at uh, our company, uh, who would be the, the first uh, like role or person we could hire? Or obviously we, we could uh, use some agency, uh, maybe that would be the first step uh, we would propose maybe. Yeah, so to understand like, how, how, how big is your company? Uh, 300. 300, and you don't have dedicated UX professionals? Oh, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we have an analytics, yeah. but uh, that's uh, data yeah. analytics. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely having, so uh, you should stick around afterwards and chat. We've got a couple of people here who both do consulting and do, um, and have built their own UX org. So it, it's, this will take a bit of a fuller discussion because it really depends on what your dire needs are. Usually, oftentimes, it starts out in UI. Like, the people are just complaining about the UI being totally unusable. People can't get into the game, or when they're in the game, they can't figure out how to change their weapons or their gear or their loadout or buy things. And so oftentimes, you're sort of tasked with solving the UI. And then only later do you realize there's actually deeper systemic problems than just the UI that's causing the confusion. And so if you're looking for UI folks, then um, probably what you need more than anything is actually like a user research solution. So you can actually get some validation on what's not working, and then you can think about some ideas about how to fix them. And so whether you want to do that internally or not, I don't know, that you can hire out um, until you decide that you want to, you're getting enough return on your investment that you'll just do it in-house. Um, but I would definitely start with getting professionals to help you user test things so you can discuss the issue. And then you'll find out, here's our backlog of issues, these things are all just 2D, you know, 2D, art, 2D artists can handle these things, but we need game designers to like actually redesign the level so that they're actually safe and fun to learn how to do and master a new mechanic. And uh, you know, wow, our game's like performance is really affecting people's enjoying, enjoyment of the game. Well, we need to task with our developers with you know, working on these performance issues in context, in, in conjunction with the level designers and the artists. So, uh, so yeah, my. Uh, happy to chat, and there's a few of us here happy to chat too. I'm sure with you about about that. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for the great talk. Um, I have a question. So, do you have any um, any of this kind of situations that you run a play test and it shows that UX is fine? And then you release the game and uh, the live data shows that it is a complete disaster and like 80% of players can pass the level five or so. Yeah, so that's an interesting question. So I've had, I haven't had that exact situation, but let me tell you another situation that I did have because, um, and again, um, Celia has talked about this too and other folks have talked about this too. Like part of UX is the usability and avoidance of frustration and part of it is, is the like engaging people in play and making them motivated to continue in play. 
And so part of the problem is, is when you're just doing user testing, oftentimes you'll focus a lot on just removing the friction. But the, the magic of the game is like, is this game fun and compelling? That's a little harder to measure sometimes. And so you might be, you'll have to tell, you can follow up on the question if you want, if you have taken measures of like how much interested they are to play and stuff like that. But I worked on, for instance, I worked on a, 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 a redesign of the Mafia Wars, it was a Facebook game, X Wars type game, and we found that um, usability-wise, the new map was a huge improvement, uh, but we found when we launched it into the wild, it didn't drive any metrics there, and we found that, we, we thought that, well, what, you know, what's going on? What can possibly explain this? Like, it's a better UX, why aren't? Well, as it turned out, it just, it just made it so that um, people who were mistargeted and weren't probably interested in playing the game just figured it out earlier. Like, they're just like, oh yeah, no, now I need to see what kind of game this is, and they just would sort of exit earlier. Um, so it, 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 improving the UX did not improve uh, retention, D1 retention in that case. Anyone else? Uh, how have you seen uh, an impact on UX since Twitch uh, really is on the rise and all live streaming and things like that? What specific, like, um, I'm just trying to specific, like is it the UX of Twitch or is it like people uh, the changing their UX of their games to better yes, support Twitch? Yes. Yeah. Okay, it's the latter, it's the, yeah. Definitely, the developers I've worked with um, most recently on like esports related games have all been about, you know, how do we, how do we support Twitch and how do we, both from the, the caster perspective, also from the observer perspective, and it affects, it, it does actually affect the core gameplay sometimes. Like if it, and it, this is the matter of where these trade-offs have to come into play. If you think that the, the, the key to the success of your game is that we need to support these things, that might mean that some other things that are probably important for success of the game might have to be deprioritized in terms of where they're positioned on the screen or things like that. And, and so it can, you know, have some detrimental impact on the UX of the core game itself because you need to somehow build it um, uh, build it with the room to have the streamer put their sponsor list over here and you know their picture over here and stuff like that. So I, I've definitely seen that too. Um, but most games that are you know marketing themselves as esports, they're just like it's just too important. And I think as well they're doing it strategically because they know that like Twitch isn't going to get as excited about them if they don't support all the Twitch features and things like that. It's just going to be a, like a featuring thing. So they, they you have to make compromises sometimes if you believe that's important to your success. Hi, thanks Hi. for the great talk. Um, what do you think, like, can you show me, <laughs> is there an example where the KPIs really rose due to UX? Um, let me give you a couple of cases. That would make me feel very, very good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so one is more of the mental, the, the uh, hypothetical. So I asked uh, uh, someone who I'd worked with, you know, why do you pay my fees to do this sort of stuff? You know, we're not, we're not actually measuring any kind of pre and post. You know, how do you, you know, how are you sure that you're getting a good return on your investment? And he said, well, I believe that what you've done is like way more than enough to move some of our metrics, you know, a percent or two in this direction and that. And he said over the long haul for cost of user acquisition, he said, I'm getting a tenfold return on my investment in you if I, in, you know, if I believe that. So that's not a really empirical answer, but that is a way to sort of couch, uh, couch it if you're trying to cost justify it or, or get someone excited about paying for all this stuff. Um, I, my, the, the examples that I'm thinking of, so for instance, actually on Crimson Skies, um, we, uh, tying it to sales, it's the tying it to sales or tying it to performance is the, is the hard part. I've, it, for Crimson Skies, for instance, we went from the, the product team being not very confident uh, in developing a, delivering a, a great product, so you know, we're gonna reduce market spend, we're not gonna build up expectations, we're not gonna put it on TV, that sort of stuff. But then as they started to see progress through the playtest metrics, they got more and more confident. Now, that's not a great example because Crimson Skies did like mediocre to okay. So that's not an example. Um, I'm, oh yeah, duh, okay, yeah. I was thinking all about UI UX stuff, but this is about technical stuff. So actually at Zynga we bothered to study uh, things like um, 
uh, frames per second for some sort of proxy for responsiveness. Uh, and we load times and things like that. And we definitely saw movement on monetization when we, when they, when they were in a bad case. And when we improved those things, we saw lifts. So that's, it doesn't, it, I mean, if, if that's not your focus, then, you know, but it, but, uh, maybe that's enough of a proximal case to say, well, this is, this, these things are adding friction to the game and making it less fun to play. Well, here are other things that make the game less fun to play, and they're probably costing us something, too. But I don't have that direct correlation. I have a, a publisher that I work with who's supposed to get me, um, we did a redesign of the UI for one of his little, really small games, and he's supposed to get me a slide of, uh, he did show a lift, actually, in retention, but I don't have that yet, so I can't talk about it. <laughs> So hello. Hello. Uh, so this uh, UX U, UX bar eraser person. So if I understand it correctly, this can be actually anyone. For example, even programmer, designer. So it's basically a person who is trying to improve the state in his field or his yeah, I think domain. Have, I think you have two two roles as a UX bar eraser. One role is is within your functional technical group, right, to make sure that I know what the, the key uh, drivers of user experience are for my discipline uh, and make sure that we're doing a good job at that. But also, it's someone ideally who thinks more holistically about what a game is, what a healthy game is, and um, is able to think about it in other domains too, because bar, we should be able to talk across departments to each other. This is about building that culture. Um, and we should be able to talk to, across departments, and I and I should my lead programmer should be able to criticize me for the con, the decisions I made about control scheme. Um, so it's really both kind of aspects. So those are basically people who care, actually. Yeah, care and who show the ability to be trusted, like that people trust them uh, to have good judgment. Yeah, but caring is a great start because <laughs> they can be they can be trained too and mentored. Time is up for today. Thank you, Jason, one more time. Let's give him a round of applause.